I'm Uta Franke. I'm a human geneticist, originally from Germany, as you can hear. And I'm an emeritus professor here at Stanford and also senior medical director at 23andMe. Um, well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we've been talking a lot and learning a lot about mm -hmm. uh, the genome, what it's made of, and right now we've been focusing on how big it is. And uh, we, we, we've learned that there are about three billion base pairs in the human genome. And there's a lot of research that's mm -hmm. gone on for a long time. And we're hoping you can maybe shed some light on what we know about the research that led to us understanding how big the genome is and sort of where we are now. You know, there were early estimates of the size of the genome simply by the measuring the amount of DNA in a cell. People mm -hmm. could do that a long time ago. And so the estimate was in that range of three billion base pairs. But the idea to actually sequence it was came up in the mid 80s mm -hmm. when capillary sequencing was developed. And many people thought it was an absolutely crazy idea because it's so huge, so much information. And it was also known that there was a lot of repetitive DNA in it, so people said, is it really worth it to, to find the genes that are really important in this huge, huge amount of information? But then, when it was agreed upon to embark on it as an international venture, it was also decided that we're not going to do just the human. We also want to do model organisms that people work on in the laboratory, like the roundworm, the fruit fly, and then to compare the human and the animal information at the same time. And at that time, we already knew that the relative genome sizes of these different animals were, were different at the time, right? Yeah, that was already known. And the other thing to know about the Human Genome Project, when it finally got started around 1990, the first five years were devoted to just mapping the chromosomes. You know. People heard about chromosomes, and we know that DNA runs in chromosomes from one end to another. So it would make sense, logical sense, to start sequencing at one end and then go through. But instead, what people did, they made maps of the chromosomes, and then you could focus in on specific region and do the sequencing there. And also to find genes that are located in specific chromosome regions. I see. So instead of having to sort of, like you say, sequence from one end to the other, you could mm -hmm. have many starting places in the middle of a chromosome and sort of read out from there. Right. And you could relate the sequence to the chromosomal features because chromosomes, when they are treated with a certain agent, display banding patterns that are very unique. Therefore, we can identify each chromosome individually, which is something you cannot do when they are uniformly stained. And also we can see within each chromosome there are certain regions. And now we can find out in which region certain genes are located. And all of this physical mapping, as it's called, was done before the sequencing even started. So what happened when the sequencing project started? You mentioned it was an international collaboration. Uh, was this uh, really countries all over the world, or were they more from one region or another? Or? Well, there were countries who had developed infrastructure to take on such a big project. And in Europe, it was predominantly the UK, France, and Germany. And Canada was a player, as well as Japan and China. And all of these people got together under the chairmanship, so to say, of Francis Collins, who is now the director of the NIH. He was organizing this big international thing and made sure there wasn't too much waste and duplication. They were dividing up the chromosomes. Like here you do chromosome 21. OK, that's where we are focusing on. And then they had regular meetings. They exchanged information. All the results were immediately shared and put online. And therefore, because of this international effort, um, this led to success, ultimately. And this obviously took a period of, of time. Uh, and I imagine it sort of was stop and go at different times. You know, how, how does mm -hmm. this fit? You know, the, mm -hmm. this big initial effort to sequence it um, as far as a time scale. How long did it take? Well, they started in 1990. And for the first five years, they did just mapping. And then it was slow to get seriously into sequencing. It was estimated that it would be finished in 2005. But then, in the late 90s, there was also a commercial company called Celera. They said, we can do this even faster. You guys are just too slow. We have better methods. And we can chop up the genome in small sequences and sequence the small pieces and have the computers line it all up and put it together. And that's when 
a serious race started because a company threatened that whatever genes they would discover, they would patent, and therefore the medical benefits would go to them rather than to the public. And therefore, in 2000, both of them, the International um, Consortium and the company, announced that they had a draft sequence of the human genome. This draft was very imperfect. It was full of holes, full of mistakes. And then the International Consortium spent another three years to finishing it up. So in 2003, then they said, OK, mission accomplished. Here it is. You had, the, you had a draft. Now, where are we now with sequencing the human genome or many human genomes? Are we multiple drafts beyond? And are we reaching out to many people? Yes, yeah, see, the original genome that was sequenced in the company, it was mostly the company CEO, Quay Quentas, the genome. But the international effort had many different people involved. So the genome is a composite of sequences of many individuals. And that's called the reference genome. But what you really want to know is what is different between the genomes of different people who live in different parts of the world. And that was the next effort then, to, to really sequence individuals with known ethnic background and find out what are the variations mm -hmm. between humans. And that's when it really became interesting. And that took another 10 years to become really useful to have that information. Um, so what does the size of a genome mean? Does it mean anything at all? Well, there are some organisms with the huge genomes, like the salamanders, you know. And what is all that sequence? It probably has no informational content. Sometimes genomes get big because viruses get in, and they replicate. They make copies of themselves. And that has no useful function. So there is only a smaller part of the genome that's really important because it has function. And this is something we are still working on unraveling the functions. That was beautiful. Um, I think that's all I want to ask about genome okay. size. So now, yeah. as a natural segue, we're going to mm -hmm. pick up into um, the coding regions. And I'm going to mm -hmm. let you say all of it. Um, I'm just going to try to set you up and then let you talk about it. And I'll just do ask follow-up questions. Oh, you can you can go back and forth. More, oh. more dialogue is oh, sure. fine with yeah. me. You know, I don't oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, but you're doing a great job talking, so like yeah, telling the story. Yeah, but I don't want story. to lecture, you know. <laughs> well, that's okay. I mean, that's sort of the, the idea of the interview yeah. even mm -hmm. here is mm -hmm. um, I want you to, to be free to tell the story. Um, but I'll definitely ask questions okay. here. Um, so th we have three billion base pairs and just one copy mm -hmm. of the human genome. And we, we've learned that you know, we have two copies of the human genome, of the nuclear genome in, in our cells. And we've been learning a bit about the coding regions, the protein coding regions. Uh, what, what can you tell us about the relative size of the protein coding regions of the genome versus the sort of non-coding regions? Uh, this was, of course, a motivation to start it. We want to find out all protein coding genes, because these are the ones initially considered the most important part. And uh, as you know, the protein coding genes are divided into exons and introns, and only the exons have the actual information for the amino acids. Has this been covered in the course? Yes. Okay. Uh, Okay. Well, hold on. Actually, hold on. Let, me, let me think for a second. No, this is lesson okay. three. Okay. Uh, so we don't know that yet. Okay, so the, the big question was how many protein coding genes are there in the genome? And initially, before the genome project, the, uh, the number that's been kicked around was like 100,000, mm -hmm. sort of a wild guess. And then between 2000 and 2003, there was an official betting game going on where people could put down a dollar and a number. And then a year later, it was $5, and then it was $20, because then it was became more difficult. And everybody could only put down one bet. About 150 people put down a bet. And their range, the ranges of their guesses went from, you wouldn't believe it, 25,000 to 150,000. Wow. So nobody had really any good idea. The mean was around 61,000 genes. And when the first draft was published, they said, well, we had a brief look at it, and we think it's between 30 and 35,000. And when it was finally finished, the number had come down to 20 to 25,000. And many people were surprised, because this is hardly any more than the, f the roundworm or mm -hmm. the fruit fly. Mm 
So the humans are so much more complex, shouldn't they have more protein coding genes? Right. But there is a mechanism how you can ha make many proteins from one gene, and this is called alternative splicing. You are going to get to this later in the course. That means you can take bits and pieces from one gene and you put them together differently and then they encode different proteins. So the complexity cannot be immediately dedu deduced from the number of genes when you don't know what these, these genes can be used for. So what percentage of the genome is actually made up of coding region, roughly? It's only one to two percent. And um, so all this other, you know, 90, 98 to 99 percent then, I mean, a lot of people who, you know, are just learning about the genome may be wondering, what exactly is the rest of that sequence doing? You see, originally people thought it was just junk. It was just a virus getting in and replicating itself. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, people started to look at how much of that sequence is being made into RNA, how much is being transcribed. And to everyone's surprise, more than 80 percent is actually made into a copy of RNA. And these RNAs have all kinds of interesting functions. For example, to regulate activity of other genes, to regulate the activity of messenger RNAs, how they are being translated, and many different functions that the RNAs have. Some of them are structural. I mean, there are RNAs that are the structural components of the ribosome. And Otherwise, outside of the coding sequence, there are control regions that are important to regulate the activity of each gene. I see. So um, we learn in this lesson about mm -hmm. messenger RNA, mm -hmm. mRNA. And so what you're saying, there are actually other kinds of RNAs that can be made besides mRNA that doesn't get turned into protein? That's right. And what was found out recently, that you remember there are two strands in the DNA, and the messenger RNA is only made of one strand that gives the information for the protein. But what is being found out now is that there are antisense RNAs, that actually the other strand of DNA can also be made into RNA. It goes in the opposite direction. It has no coding function for proteins, usually not, sometimes it does, but it has regulatory function. I mean, you just can imagine if a gene is transcribed in the other direction, then the transcription of the messenger RNA has a problem. You know, it runs into, a, it's a train wreck, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there is a regulation of gene activity by antisense RNA. That's one mechanism. Right. So it sounds like maybe some of the complexity of different species or um, the complexity of cells mm -hmm. is in part not so much the, the sheer content, the number of genes you have, but maybe how you regulate all of those genes together to, to create something. What we are finding out now is that the genomic regions communicate with each other. Like you can have an enhancer region that is downstream away from the gene or even in an intron of another gene that then folds over, communicates with the promoter and sets in motion the messenger RNA synthesis. So the whole genome is three-dimensional. It's not just one-dimensional series of letters. It has a lot of three-dimensional arrangement and interaction that's very important for its function. We'll actually talk a lot or a little bit more about mm -hmm. that in lesson four, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned exons and introns, which are yeah. a part of mRNAs. And the exons are the coding regions, the actual parts that get turned into protein. And we seem to have learned in our uh, little time spent with the material that the exons seem much smaller in general than the introns. The introns seem to be very big a lot of times. Um, do we know anything about the, the size of exons and introns and sort of how or why that, that exists? There is a huge variation in intron size. Some can be very small and some can be absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. And we don't know exactly why that is. The last exon is usually larger than the other exons because it contains the signal to stop and then the, the untranslated region, which is important for regulatory purposes. And introns in the middle of the gene, they can be tiny or can be bigger, and we don't know exactly, I don't understand why it evolved this way. So what are we still learning in general about the genome and the coding and the non-coding regions? Um, are there any really important concepts or um, 
new findings that you think are really interesting that we're learning about either the size of the genome or not so much the size, but the um, number of coding regions, the amount of coding region, and how it interacts? What we're learning about the genome is more about the function of the non-coding regions. You know, there are, for example, small nuclear RNAs. These are small RNAs that are part of, a, part of the nucleus that are encoded in introns. And they are encoded in introns. When the intron is degraded, these little RNAs are released and they have very important functions in the body. And this was found out, like a research we did in our lab, when we compared the human and the mouse, the exon sequences did not code for protein and they were not at all conserved. And the intron sequences were conserved because that's where the functional units are located. So there are all kind of surprises, you know, you shouldn't only think the exon's important, the intron is junk and gets thrown away. No, it can be the opposite. Um, you also mentioned repetitive DNA when you were talking about mm. some of, uh, I guess, the historical context of the genome and, and even once we sequenced it, if anyone does any research on their own, they might find that there's still a lot of repetitive regions. What do we know about those in the genome? You know, most of them are just remnants. I mean, they were copies made of some early viral intruder, and now they are degenerated. There are bits and pieces of them. But there are still some active copies. And what they can do, they can still make copies of themselves, and they can jump around and insert somewhere else in the genome and actually cause problems. They can cause disease by inserting into an important protein coding genes. So we are not done with dealing with all these repetitive sequences. They're still changing. And that means there is huge variability from one person to another as well. I think that's an amazing concept, too, to think about our genomes. We sort of think of them as, OK, we have the static genome. Mm -hmm. And it may right. interact with itself to create a protein or regulation. But the genome itself is changing. Um, even today, like you said, this right. idea of moving it's, elements. It's still evolving. What a, um, I just maybe, oh. So when people talk about variation in the human genome, mm -hmm. we oftentimes uh, talk about uh, single nucleotide variants, which we'll come to in, in later lessons for, for our course. Um, is that the main kind of variation that exists in the human genome, or these single letter differences, or are there other kinds of variation that um, are important too? We have identified about 15 million single letter differences. But so by sheer number, they are the most common. But then there are other variants, they are called copy number variations, where whole chunks of the genome can be repeated, and they can be present in either two, three, or many copies. And there are differences between human beings. So some people have two copies, some have five, some may have 12. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the total number of nucleotides involved in those, then this is more common. So the individual copy number variants or CNVs are fewer than the ones we have identified for SNVs. But if you look at the amount of genomic sequence involved in this type of what's called structural variation, in, it involves a larger part of the genome. I see. So between single mm -hmm. nucleotide uh, variants and copy number uh, variation, um, those are the two main kinds or the two main forms of variation in humans. Yeah, then there are others like inversions where certain pieces of the genome can be turned around in some people and not in others. And even um, translocations. How viable are translocations and do they get propagated at all in a population over time or are most translocations inviable? Well, we find them in families. You know, there are balanced translocations where a piece of a chromosome is taken off and hooked somewhere else or two pieces have been exchanged. And as long as they are balanced, meaning that the right number of genes is there, people are fine. They wouldn't know about it unless the break is in a gene, but that's pretty unusual. The break is most often in a repetitive sequence. But then when these people may have children, because of what happens in meiosis, that the chromosomes align and cross over, it's possible that a child inherits a chromosome that only has an extra copy and mm -hmm. is then get the other one that's missing something, then you have an unbalanced translocation. And that can cause very bad developmental defects, uh, intellectual def deficits. These are the children who we see in the clinic. And we look at their chromosomes and look at their parents, and we see the translocation has been passed on through several generations already.
but otherwise they don't last in, in populations. Well, you were just touching on something that I want us to move on and talk about for, mm -hmm. for Lesson 12 mm -hmm. now. Um, I want to know a bit more about your background and your experience. You have a lot of experience uh, with human genetics and um, both in research but also clinically, mm -hmm. um, looking at families and individuals of, with various phenotypes. Um, I'd like for you to start maybe, tell us when you first fell in love with genetics and when you started studying and sort of your journey to where you are today as a, as a Stanford professor. I went to medical school in Germany and then I trained in pediatrics. I came to this country to train at Los Angeles Children's Hospital and then I had to think about what else to do and what I really wanted to do was endocrinology because I loved biochemistry. I thought biochemistry was the best thing in medical school. But I couldn't get in as a foreign medical graduate and genetics was just in the beginning started to get interesting. It was at the time where it became possible to identify chromosomes by chromosome banding. And there weren't many people going into that field, which had a great advantage because as a fellow at UCLA in, in human genetics, I was allowed to do anything. I could learn chromosomes, biochemical genetics, as well as see the patients on the wards where people said, oh, what is this malformation? Is it a syndrome? Is it genetic? Will it happen again? So the training involved from the beginning clinical genetics and the other subspecialties of genetics. I and see, and well, I was going to say, um, uh, so did you, were you able to interact in, 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 I guess, medical school and beyond as you were sort of discovering um, the area that you were sort of uh, going to focus on mm -hmm. uh, for, for genetics? At the same time, were you able to experience the clinical side of genetics as well? All the time. I was active in clinical genetics for the last 30-something years. And what does that involve exactly? Well, in pediatrics, you're mostly focused on children having problems. So either children who inherit something or children who get very sick after they are born because they cannot metabolize protein, there's something wrong in their metabolism, or children who have certain birth defects children who don't do well in school, who are late walking, who are late acquiring skills or have neurological symptoms, seizures. So all kinds of problems that people didn't know what is this. So there was a lot of discovery to do. We found out that certain clinical phenotypes were associated with chromosomal duplications or deletions. Now mm -hmm. that we could look at chromosomes in higher resolution, mm -hmm. so that was the first stage, so in the 70s make discoveries this way. And now, of course, whole genome sequencing is applied to these children. And when nobody had could figure out what caused their problem, you look at their whole sequence and you can find a change. And that's been very successful in the last couple of years since high, high throughput sequencing methods were developed. So the exciting thing about my own career is the two-way street. It's always been two ways between the clinic and the laboratory. You see somebody fascinating in the clinic and you bring samples to the lab and you tell your PhDs, look, this is what the patients look like and we have to figure out what's going on here and that gets everybody motivated. When you learn something in the lab, you find a gene, like we found a gene for Red syndrome and then you can figure out, can we do anything to help these patients? Now that we have the gene, we figure out its function. In the last few years, we spent a lot of time making mouse models mm -hmm. because we looked at diseases that involve the central nervous system. And you can't go into a human brain and take a sample. I'm but sure there are many ethical concerns there. But, I mean, some people have part of the brain removed because of some medical indication. And then, of course, um, you can get it. But what we did make mouse models because the genome is very conserved between the human and the mouse. And even though we're working with deletion syndromes where part of a chromosome is missing, we can define where in the mouse genome that part is located. It's got the same genes in it. Take it out in the mouse. And then you have mice that you can study their development prenatally, mm -hmm. afterwards, take the brain, cut it up, look at what's going on. And this is what we did mostly in, well, in this millennium, I would say. <laughs> well, it sounds like, uh, I mean, this is good, good old-fashioned science, really good science, and to people who aren't familiar, it sounds like detective work. You, you sort of establish or you mm -hmm. see, you make an observation and then you go investigate. Mm 
Um, I, I'm really sh uh, struck by, even still, by the idea that the human and the mouse genome are similar enough that you're even able to do that. Can you speak for a second about you know, working in genetics, especially with human genetics, where there's so many mm -hmm. limitations, about the constraints, but also the tools you have to, to answer certain questions um, for people who may not be familiar with the idea that the mouse and the human genome are, in fact, quite mm -hmm. similar. Well, the mouse is such a useful, use, useful organism because mouse genetics has developed parallel to human genetics and many mutations and phenotypes were spontaneously already detected in the mouse. So you already knew there was a mouse model for this disease and you mm -hmm. could go and study it right away. And for those where they did not arise spontaneously, the mouse is ideal because you can manipulate the embryonic stem cells. You can introduce mutations in the mouse that you know exist in the human. Therefore you make a mouse model that exactly replicates biochemically what's in the human. The mice don't always have the same phenotypes, obviously, because they have a much smaller brain and many other differences. Right, but uh, they're similar enough that when you look at those differences mm -hmm. or the, um, what happens when you change the genetics of the mouse, you can then adapt that back to the clinic sometimes? Well, sure, you can also use the mouse to try out any drugs that you may come up with, any ideas you have for treatment. You can give it to the mouse and see whether there is an effect. Um. So in, in, in your time, in your clinical and, and research experience, what, um, what area did you focus on more specifically? What, what would you say is your, your general research uh, subject? There were too many to mention. <laughs> I really started out with whatever was possible to do at the time. Mm -hmm. you know, I was in a way driven by technology that was being developed and I saw where this technology could be applied to the, the problem. So it started with cytogenetics in the area of banding chromosomes, that was in the 70s. And then biochemical genetics, somatic cell genetics, meaning that you can fuse cells from different organisms and you can map chromosomes. So in the beginning of the Genome Project we were very much invested in mapping genes to chromosomal regions mm -hmm. with the idea if you have a gene that's been cloned and you know the function you map it to a chromosome region where we already know a certain disease gene has been mapped, then becomes a candidate gene for this disease. And that was a, a useful approach in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And then as all these other technologies became available to study global gene expression patterns and doing mouse modeling. And we then we moved to studying individual diseases like Rett syndrome, and Robert syndrome is a malformation syndrome. And ultimately, I thought the deletion syndromes where you take out a chunk of chromosome and would be interesting because there are many different genes in here. Mm -hmm. And which of these genes contribute to what part of the phenotype? I found that fascinating. And that um, was the projects we are working on in the end. So it, it's a stepwise process of discovery that makes use of the technology as it is being developed. So you can say it's opportunistic, yes it is. Ultimately my goal was always to find some treatments for some of these genetic diseases that we see in the clinic. What was one of your most uh, exciting <coughs> or um, fun discoveries uh, in, in research or in the clinic? Or do you have a favorite um, idea or time or story? Yeah, the most exciting was the snow RNAs, this, this small nuclear RNAs that are in introns because this is a syndrome called Prader-Willi syndrome and what it looks like is the children are born very floppy and very difficult to feed and what happens after a while they get stronger and they start eating and everybody is happy finally Jimmy eats his food and they start eating too much and they become massively obese if you don't watch it in no time so the problem was what is going on with these children and we, we tried to make a mass um, to find out the deletion was quite large, four and a half megabases, several genes in it. And we found out with many different things I can't explain in the short time, but that it's actually the snow RNA that is responsible. We made a mouse model taking out just the snow RNA from the introns. Mm -hmm. And these mice 
They don't get obese, but they don't stop eating. So it's a signal that tells you, I had enough. It's a satiety signal that's missing. Wow. The children sit, they don't eat very fast. They just keep eating, keep mm -hmm. eating. The mice do the same thing. So you were able to essentially sort of discover the genetic underpinning of that. Mm -hmm. Is there um, any treatment that you were able to do anything with from, from that discovery? Many people are now working on this. We made the mice, we let them, we distribute them to everybody who works on obesity. I mean, you can imagine if you figure out how the snoring is, what are the genes they are actually regulating? What are the mechanisms of action for the snoring is? We don't know that yet. And so we hope that ultimately a treatment will come out not only for this rare condition called prader willi syndrome, but maybe for people who have a problem with appetite around the world. Right. What do you think is the most difficult part of your research that you've done, um, in general speaking, though, for maybe research in general? What do you think is the most difficult part? Okay, not technologically difficult, but in terms of managing and handling. Yeah, the most difficult part is if you feel you get unfair reviews, if there is competition with things going on in the background. You know, reviews of papers and grants are anonymous, and so you sometimes get reviews back that you think are totally unfair, and there's nothing you can do. You don't, you don't know who's shooting from where. Right. So it's that is the hardest part. Collaborations with people you know, you can manage, you know, you can Sometimes they go sour, but at least you know the person. You can sit down and say, hey, let's straighten this out. We had a, a difference, and now we are friends again, right? Exactly. <laughs> and if it's anonymous, um, you don't you, you right. can't really defend yourself. Sort of off camera or on camera, I know there are a lot of people who are pushing for um, uh, to make peer review not anonymous. Because oh, they, yeah. they want it to be so that you can actually you know, call someone out and say, hey, that wasn't a fair See, it, review. It's much more constructive. So, yeah. for example, I work for a journal called PeerJ, Peer, P-E-R-R-J, -E it's an open access journal, mm -hmm. where the people who agree to review agree to make, it, make themselves known, and then the whole correspondence between the reviewers and the original manuscript and then the revision and everything is going to be online. So people can actually learn what happened during this review and how did this reviewer improve the paper. Mm -hmm. So the reviews you get back are really constructive. They give you all kinds of good ideas, what else you can do to make it better. Right. Um, so thinking about um, what you do as a career, um, what do you think the future is for people who are interested in being clinicians and bridging the gap between um, you know, people and the research that can help them? Do you think there's going to be a, a, a bigger opening in, in, in the future for people who want to who do something mm -hmm. similar to, to what you well, do? Well, there is a, definitely a need and there are many opportunities. But the drawbacks are in genetics, for example. We don't have enough people coming into medical genetics out of the medicine side because in genetics you don't make any money. We don't have procedures, we don't, st don't stick tubes into people that we can charge for. It's all cognitive. You know, you spend a lot of time going through complicated information, searching the literature, sitting down with the family, counseling them. You don't get reimbursed much for this. Sure. And therefore, it's not attractive, not, if, not for people who went to American medical schools and to enter a career as a medical geneticist. So we have a shortage, and many of the most successful people are foreign-trained medic medical doctors who don't have to pay for their medical education. Well, we hopefully have a, a very large international audience, um, you know, participating mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. course. What would you say to a student or in a lifetime learner who's watching and is really interested in the subject and may even be interested in thinking about this as a career, what advice would you give them? I mean, I can only say this has been a lifetime learning experience to be part of genetics during those decades when everything developed, and we are not done yet. I think it goes on and will be even more exciting. There are many secrets in the genome that are yet to be unraveled, and both PhDs and, and MDs should uh, consider this. And then the genetic counseling, that's a whole new career path. We have a training program here at Stanford for genetic counselors. It's a master's program.
because you don't have to have a PhD or an MD to tell people this is what we found in your sequence and this is what it means. And these people are trained specifically to do that and we'll need a ton of them, lots of them. So I want to encourage people to consider this as a career. Great. Um, as all the questions I have, do you want to talk about your affiliation with 23andMe at all or do you want to just sort of leave it as the Stanford um, connection? Um, I think I'd rather do this as a Stanford no. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'll open it up to you. Is there anything else, either about the genome subjects or about, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing because human genetics yeah, research? If, that you, if want you to talk ask about? me on Twenty Three and Me, that would be another half an hour because yeah. there's <laughs> a the lot time. going on at Twenty Three and Me that I find exciting. And why did I decide to work with them? Right, and how long right, have right. I worked with them? And so, shh, you, don't, you don't want <laughs> all of this. Well, is there anything else about the genome or the genome size? Anything like I'd love to know. Like when you teach genetics in mm -hmm. the classroom, mm -hmm. what do you, what do you say to students to get them excited about? Uh, genetics and, and the genome. Mm, what student what students find they find exciting is often the applied part, you know, bioengineering. Now that we find out these things about plants and and what can we do to improve food supply for the world by genetic by bioengineering genetic engineering and yeah. also making models for diseases. He said the mice are just used as a matter of convenience because they're already a genetically well-studied organisms, the smallest mammal. But you would much rather have larger organisms. And now they're, they're being able to make whole organs of the pig, mm -hmm. for example, in, in vitro, more or less. I mean, the, all of these this developments are, are exciting. Mm -hmm. So I talk about induced pluripotent stem cells, how you can make different cell types and organs from fibroblasts and how you can study diseases in a dish. You know, a patient with Parkinson's disease, we can take a skin biopsy, make these cells into neurons and then study the mechanism that in the brain gives these people Parkinson's disease. And those are sort of the genome itself. I talk about repetitive sequences and they find this boring. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Um, the, uh, I was going to say, um, I find that the, the evolution of the genome itself is just fascinating and I'm really intrigued by how people use genetic information to look back in time uh, um, to sort of look at connections. My, I, the lab I, in undergrad mm -hmm. I worked in a yeast, a yeast mm -hmm. lab and mm -hmm. was really interested in the um, phylogenetics of Specifically, the R uh, the C terminal domain of RNA polymerase mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. um, it's very conserved from yeast to, to human. You know, there's no RNAs. Archaea have it already. Archae there's no RNAs. Have what? Archaea yeah. bacteria yeah. have no RNAs. Yeah, these are I ancient. Know you know, Gosh. there was an RNA world before DNA right. even came in existence. Yeah, so I know it's it's fascinating, yeah. and I think I think um, maybe something I do want to get this on camera. Um, as a geneticist, human or otherwise. How do you know something's important? Is it the fact that you see it conserved in many different species? Or is there something else that, that goes on that tells you, okay, this sequence or, or this event is really important? But it defines what you think is important. If you are interested in the evolution, then anything that traces back to lower organisms and is conserved is, is interesting or changes through evolution are interesting because then you can understand the underpinning of evolution. But if you want to find out what makes humans so special, why do we have language, why do we have ethical considerations, then you look for something that you only find in humans and not in, in other organisms. So it depends what's interesting to you.